Space Hog would be frequently labeled as a glam inspired band and they would emerge out of nowhere during the mid 90s. While most people know them for one song in the meantime, this track was prominently featured in the trailer and soundtrack for Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and the video games Guitar Hero 5 and Rock Band 3 as on-disc tracks. Space Hog would tour with some of the biggest rock bands on the planet, including Oasis, R.E.M., Pearl Jam, and Red Hot Chili Peppers, in addition to releasing four studio records. Despite all being from the UK though, the members, with the exception of the brothers, never met there and didn't have as much success back home as they did in America. It would result in some in their home country of writing them off as an American creation. The history of Space Hog begins with the Langdon brothers, Antony and Royston. Antony is the eldest of the two. Both of them were raised in Leeds in the UK, and the brothers came from a pretty musical family, performing in church choir and playing in bands together growing up. Their early musical influences would include the likes of the Beatles, David Bowie, Queen, Led Zeppelin, and Royston always had dreams of living a glamorous life, something he would chalk up to his mother, who frequently bought Vogue magazine. He'd see these images of well-dressed models getting out of expensive cars, and they seemed more like the types of people who favored cocktails over beer at the local pub. Couple this with growing up in the 70s, and Royston would revel in the atmosphere of gender bending and dressing androgynously, even admitting to sometimes wearing his mother's makeup. He would apparently even show up on a 1980s TV show in the UK, and he would appear on the program with his band at the time, The Raspberries. Antony, meanwhile, was a restless spirit, soon leaving Leeds, and he found himself living in Switzerland, Hong Kong, and London before he followed his girlfriend to New York City. This was around the early 90s. That girlfriend, though, would end up later dumping him around 1994. Royston, feeling bad for his older brother, opted to pay him a visit in New York to cheer him up. Royston at the time was playing in a different band who was on the verge of getting signed to a record label deal with a company called Rhythm King, but he wasn't really happy with the band and he really detested the British music press. He would in fact tell the Toronto Star, I was dreading all the small-minded students with angst and acne kind of writing about us. You can be one of the enemy darling bands and then six months later, they're slagging you off and printing funny pictures of you. A few days prior to Royston actually arriving in New York, Antony would meet a drummer named Johnny Craig at an espresso bar where the drummer, funny enough, worked as a barista and a rat killer. Craig at the time was living with a friend sleeping on his floor and really only came to America after being bored back home, wanting to leave his partying and drug lifestyle behind. He'd also admit that he crossed the ocean in search of rock and roll, something that he struggled to find back home. The drummer was offered a job to clean the basement of an espresso bar only to later learn that it was rat infested. It would turn out the espresso bar shared a basement with a pharmacy and the rats were now nesting in the old boxes of medicine, but it actually made his job easier as the rats would be high on downers. While working at the espresso bar in March of 1994, Craig would overhear someone talking in the Leeds accent. That person happened to be Antony. The two would strike up a conversation and they soon started jamming together and Royston showed up a few days later. So the seeds of Space Hog would be planted. Royston would front the group and play bass while his brother played guitar. And Royston's initial plans were just to pay his brother a visit for a week or so, but that soon changed. Royston had already written a number of songs by this point in time for his band, The Zeros, and he was enthralled by New York City. So the timing was perfect. He would tell song facts. I think New York's a great place for people that are curious. New York will always be a great place to have a social life. And when I say social life, I don't mean NYU students going out in the East Village on a Friday or Saturday night. I'm talking about really meaningful connections with other humans from all over the planet. At the time, the band had another guitarist soon join them, but he didn't share their love of David Bowie and Mott the Hoople, so they dismissed him. In search of a lead guitarist, Craig had a buddy back home in Leeds named Richard Steele, who he sent a demo of Space Hog's early songs to. Steele liked the demo so much that he made the flight over to America. Steele at the time was actually playing in a band called Robinson, which he would describe as being a British version of the Smashing Pumpkins. All while this was going on, the members of course had to support themselves and they worked a variety of jobs illegally though. Antony was working as a photographer's assistant and a bike messenger while Royston was working as an intern at a recording studio where he made about five bucks an hour. But it was at the studio that he met Space Hog's producer for their first album, Bryce Goggin. Steele, however, didn't have a job. 
According to the Ottawa Citizen, the band was soon hanging out with the voluptuous horror of Karen Black, and some of Spacehog's early shows saw them play for drag queens. But words soon started to spread around New York about the band's live shows in the East Village, and record labels took notice. And the timing couldn't have been better because the band was running out of money. Craig lost his job, the Langdon brothers weren't making enough money to survive, and Steel, of course, wasn't working. But this period only lasted for a few weeks, and the band soon played a showcase for five different record labels. It was at this showcase that one of the executives at Columbia Records got into a fistfight with one of the executives from another label over signing the band. But the funny part was, Spacehog didn't sign with Columbia, instead opting to go with an outfit called Hi-Fi Recordings. Spacehog almost wrote Hi-Fi off, having never heard of them before, but the band's lawyer was insistent that they hear their pitch, and then Hi-Fi would call the members one day telling them that they were now affiliated with Sire Records and Elektra, and a deal was soon signed. With a record label deal in hand, the members were now resident aliens, which meant that despite not being American citizens, they could work in America, having acquired their green cards. That gave the band the name of their first record. The cover is also a nod to this featuring a fake immigration visa, which is issued by a place called New Yorkshire, a nod to their roots in the UK and their new home in America. As for the band's name, it would be given to them by a promoter in New York. They originally planned on calling themselves Grass, but there already was a band named Supergrass, who funny enough, they would actually tour with later on. As for the alien and space themes, the band would chalk that up to the fact that being musicians was alien to a lot of people. Most people couldn't relate to that kind of profession. In March of 1995, Space Hog would head to upstate New York to Bearsville Studios to record their debut album, Resident Alien. It was the same studio that played home to some pretty big musicians, including the Stones, the band, and Bob Dylan. Royston would take a couple of songs he had written in his previous band, The Zeros, and he wrote a couple more with his new bandmates. These songs would form the backbone of Resident Alien and included the tracks in the meantime, Zeros, Candyman, and Dictator. The band's influences would include Queen, T-Rex, Mott the Hoople, David Bowie, as well as Thin Lizzy in addition to the Beatles and some elements of punk rock. The song that got Space Hog on everyone's radar would be the track In the Meantime. Royston would find inspiration at the age of 12 when he was playing in a band called RVs and one of his bandmates was named Paul who he referred to as having an educated record collection. And one of the records that was in his collection was from the group Penguin Cafe Orchestra. On that album is a song called Telephone and Rubber Band. That song stuck in Royston's mind for a long time and the band would sample the track. The sound sample is a recording of when a phone line wire gets crossed. Royston would tell Songfax what the track was about, saying, It's me trying to reach people. It's using some kind of metaphor or worldly or inner-worldly search for the end of isolation, and the acceptance of oneself is in there. And I think it's also me talking to myself, getting through my anxieties and fear of death. Soon enough, college radio, rock radio, and MTV's Busbin latched onto the song in the meantime, and it would top the mainstream rock tracks chart for four weeks. It also crossed over to the Hot 100 chart, peaking at number 32. The follow-up single, Cruel To Be Kind, was a modest success, peaking at number 29 on the Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. This resulted in the band's debut record going gold, selling half a million copies. In the meantime, would become the third most played rock tune of 1996. The success of the song caught the members off guard with Anthony telling Spin, Nobody knew that in the meantime was going to be a hit. It seemed like we were the wrong fit at the wrong time. There was something a bit retro about what we were doing, and it felt like the glam aspect was a bit in the past when everyone was walking around in plaid and looking really grungy. Space Hog's sound would be frequently labeled as neo-glam, glam, futuristic, and space rock. I mean, space was obviously on their minds as three songs on Resident Alien have the names, including Space Hog, Space is the Place, and Darkseid. The press most commonly compared Royston's vocals to David Bowie and sometimes even Axl Rose, but the members would call their music, and I quote, futuristic rock with the down-home barnyard feel. Antony would tell the Winston-Salem Journal about the frequent glam label, saying, if you listen to the whole album, you quickly realize we aren't even remotely glam rock. The sound may be vaguely reminiscent of glam rock, but if anything, the single in the meantime is a parody of glam that no one seems to have gotten. It probably didn't help that the band members wore fake fur coats, they wore shiny platform shoes, dresses, and even candy-colored nail polish and dark sunglasses. Some critics even blasted the band for being too open about the, who their influences were, but Space Hog shrugged off the frequent comparisons to David Bowie, with Royston claiming that Bowie, for his part, was influenced by John Lennon. 
while Antony would tell Rolling Stone, Bowie would have never recorded Resident Alien any day of the week. It's just not an accurate comparison. The band even had some fun with their critics printing a negative review from Boston's Lollipop magazine on their tour t-shirts. While Space Hog would experience a lot of success early in their career in America, other British acts were becoming popular as well. Royston would tell the Dallas-Fort Worth News, as much as I love bands like Nirvana, things are getting too bloody serious when people are shooting heroin and shooting themselves. That's not bloody rock and roll, that's sad and stupid. But the band was adamant that they didn't consider themselves part of the Britpop movement as that happened long after they left home. Even though the band were successful in America, they weren't met with open arms back home as some in the British press shared some resentment of the group because they moved to America and made it big there first and some didn't even consider them to be a British group. It wasn't uncommon for the British press to write them off as being too Americanized and being what Americans thought of British rock as being, which was foppish clothes and over-enunciated vocals. The Manchester Evening News even dubbed Space Hog as the best British thing to come out of the United States, adding, suffice to say, Space Hog are here to stay for at least a year or two. For their first record, Space Hog would tour alongside Silvershire, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Tripping Daisy. Despite selling half a million records and nabbing some high-profile touring spots, Space Hog finished their first tour pretty much broke. You're maybe asking why were they broke? Well, the band admitted to spending their money pretty stupidly, telling the Dispatch newspaper that when they were an opening act, the headliner would sometimes show up in a broken down van, while the members of Space Hog showed up to gigs in a limo. The band was also going through a lot of turmoil in terms of dealing with the pressure of writing a successful follow-up record. The press probably didn't help as they set their expectations quite high. The New York Post would write about Space Hog, they have the potential to take over the planet, while the New York Times would write, every few years a special artist or band comes along which mysteriously defines a time, a place, and attitude musically and captures the attention of the world. Space Hog has that spark of genius and greatness. Talk about pressure. When it came time to writing the group's second album, Royston didn't want to create another in the meantime. Instead, he wanted to get as far away as possible from that tune. He didn't want the band to be defined by one song. The band would enlist some help on their second record with the opening track being co-written with the former members of Talking Heads and Brian Eno. Meanwhile, R.E.M.'s Michael Stipe would lend his vocals to the track Almond Kisses. The group's second record, titled The Chinese Album, was originally considered to be the soundtrack and basis for a film tentatively titled Mungo City, which was later renamed The Chinese Movie. The story was about a band who moves to Hong Kong from New York after failing to find success stateside, but the band eventually dismissed the plans. The Chinese records still saw a lot of comparisons to glam bands, but there were some other influences too, incorporating more orchestral arrangements, while new sounds like hip-hop beats can also be found on the record. Despite getting some positive reviews and the single Mungo City charting and nabbing a high-profile touring spot with Pearl Jam as well as Aerosmith, the Chinese album proved to be a commercial disappointment. Space Hog would soon part ways with Sire Records, eventually landing a new deal with Artemis, a label that was run by Nirvana's former manager Danny Goldberg. Despite finding a new home, the band still felt pretty hurt following the poor performance of their second album. They started drowning their sorrows in partying, and despite not having a huge hit in nearly five years, Space Hog still got a fair deal of press attention. Spin Magazine had an interesting write-up on the band titled How to Get Famous by Really Really Trying. The article summarized why this was the case, saying that number one, they looked like rock stars, and they also befriended Michael Stipe, and he even sang on one of their records, and they also toured with R.E.M. In fact, Courtney Love once made a list of ways to become famous, and she listed befriending Michael Stipe as one of those things. They also dated famous actresses and models. Royston would date and eventually marry Steven Tyler's daughter, Liv, while his brother Anthony was connected to model Kate Moss. On top of that, Anthony also became an actor and would appear alongside Christian Bale at the time in the movie Velvet Goldmine. As the band turned their attention to the third record, Royston started to suffer from writer's block, and their third record had to be recorded twice. After some failed sessions in upstate New York, the band headed to an unlikely spot, Memphis. They were also soon paired with Three Doors Down and Sister Hazel producer Paul Ebersold, and Royston would admit to a New Jersey paper that the choice of producer was made by their label, who felt like it would result in a more commercially viable record. The album's title was originally This Is America, before it officially became The Hogacy, which was taken from one of Royston's favorite films, 2001 A Space Odyssey. The band in press interviews for their third record talked about how they hoped for a hit song because 
As Royston put it to the record newspaper from New Jersey, we could use the money, we're the equivalent of Lithuanian rock royalty, we're regal but we barely have 50 cents or 50 rubles in our pockets, buy our record. Spacehog wasn't immune from the quarrels other bands who had brothers experienced and it wasn't uncommon for the Langdon brothers to sometimes come to blows with one another on stage. So it seemed fitting that in 2001 they joined the tour of Brotherly Love alongside Oasis and the Black Crows. The group's third album would underperform just like their second, and soon enough the members were becoming preoccupied with other things in their lives. It was in 2001 Royston would get engaged to Liv Tyler and eventually marry her in 2003. The following year they'd have a child. Spacehog would quietly take a hiatus starting in 2002, with Anthony telling Spin, you get bored with the other person's bullshit. everyone's got the When you're family, you can really get inside each other's heads. I completely love my brother, but often, we need a break from family members. Royston gave his own version of events, admitting, and I quote, When we made our third album, there was a lot of creative differences with the label and within the group. I've never really been happy with that record, so touring in 2001 was hard work. Spacehog's last show was scheduled to take place on September 8, 2001, but the band missed their flight. Then three days later, 9-11 happened, and so the band took it as a sign that they were done for the time being. Fast forward to 2006, Royston and his brothers would form the short-lived outfit Art Kid, and it was the same year that drummer Johnny Craig turned 40 and wanted all the bands he'd ever played with to perform at his birthday party, one of which was Spacehog. So the wheels were soon set in motion for a reunion. Work would begin on a new record sometime in 2006, and in 2008 the band played their first reunion shows. But it was also around this time that Royston was rumored to be the new frontman for the supergroup Velvet Revolver, following the band firing Scott Weiland, but those rumors would end up being not true. Space Hog's long-awaited reunion album would come in 2013, titled As It Is On Earth. The band would tour behind the album, but according to Spin, the band seemed to have officially broken up in 2014. 2018, Royston confirmed to Songfax that he was done with Space Hog, and the years since, he's pursued a solo career, while his brother has taught himself to edit, and direct films in addition to having an impressive acting career, appearing in films alongside actors Ewan McGregor, Joaquin Phoenix, and Casey Affleck. In addition to his acting, he's also been said to have been working on new music. Meanwhile, drummer Johnny Craig was in the news in 2017, but not for the reason you might expect. With the Me Too movement picking up steam around this time, a male radio DJ named Brian Henderson, who worked at a Missouri station in 1996, wrote a blog about how he was sexually assaulted by the drummer when he was posing for a photo with the members of Space Hog. In 2019, Anthony would tell Spin about the last time he heard in the meantime, admitting, I heard it on the radio when I was at Home Depot in October of 2019. It was weird because I was walking down an aisle and they have a camera thing where you can see your own image, so I saw myself walking towards the screen and in the meantime was playing. It was like I was seeing another person's reflection as if I was someone else. And that was bizarre. I wonder if I got my royalties on that, he'd laugh. That concludes today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you enjoyed today's video. And as always, if you have suggestions for future topics you'd like to see us cover, use the link in the description box below. And we'll see you again in Rock Roll Your Stories.